gives me great pleasure to, um, to introduce Tom Keneally. Uh, Thomas is really the name. I, <laughs> and you're about to find out that Tom not only is a great author and certainly an icon here in Australia, but he's written many books. He's won a Booker Award, and certainly he was responsible for the a great book, uh, Schindler's Ark, which eventually got written up as a script, and Steven Spielberg made the film uh, Schindler's List. And uh, Tom is very, very well known for that. But besides which many books, many articles, playwrights, he's a raconteur, he is, He's a most amazing fellow and I'm about to hand over. So Tom, if you'd um, get highlighted, it's over to you. Well, thank you. May I reiterate the wishes for all of us for a, a good 2021 uh, with a uh, vaccine that has a better than 75% chance of maintaining our, our lives because we all, I can tell from the faces there that I've seen, we all have plenty to say still. Uh, I'm an ancient man, I'm uh, 84, and I'm uh, like many old men, as I warned Brian, I'm a uh, prolix, that is, I, I talk. I'm, uh, I, I think the uh, technical term is bullshitter. But in any case, um, I have had this extraordinary connection with your community as a Gentile. In so far as I know I'm a Gentile, there are all those women that took, rightly or wrongly, took protection of the equivalent of Aryan papers. So I wonder how many of us are, are Jewish and uh, not, not aware of it, because some of those women were so traumatized by the, what they went through, that they never emerged from the deep cover. Uh, I encountered the story of Schindler in 1980, in October, on a hot day in uh, Los Angeles. And I stopped at a briefcase store. I'd been to a film festival with a film of mine called The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith which was about an Aboriginal who, um, uh, who committed a number of murders in the early 21st century. Uh, he was uh, the last of the bush rangers, and he uh, uh, was the basis of a movie by an excellent uh, Irish Sicilian director called Fred Skepsi. Uh, I recommend Fred's movies to you. He, Oh, there are a great number of them. Uh, but like everyone who comes from a, an Italian or Irish background, there is a, a, often a sympathy, not always sadly, but often a sympathy uh, and an interest in the, the life of the Jewish community. Uh, so I had that interest that I took into this briefcase store in Beverly Hills. In the days when localities had their own little shops, little specialist shops, and they weren't all in malls. And uh, a very colorful human being came out, a stocky man, colorful in his language. He says to me to begin with, so it's 105 degrees out here and you won't come into my air conditioned shop. Are you frightened of me? Can't you see I'm having a sale? So he, I went into his air conditioned shop and um, we got talking and he found out as a writer, he was very excited that he just read a review of a book of mine in Newsweek. Um, and um, my credit card didn't work well. So they had to call Sydney to check on it. And while I waited there, I um, got talking to this man uh, I was always, I had a layman's interest in the, those who survived the Holocaust. Uh, he quickly told me uh, a few things such as he and his wife were survivors. He quickly told me I was um, 
saved by a uh, Nazi who, although he was a Nazi, uh, was my savior. Uh, and though to me he's God, Jesus Christ, he wasn't. I like that idea of Jesus Christ, he wasn't, because Jesus, as we know, is Jewish. I often wondered why anti-Semites didn't take that into, uh, uh, in, into um, account in their prejudice against Jews. Um, I was quite uh, fascinated by the connection between Jesus and Judaism, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So I had a bit of preparation for all this, as well as that during my childhood. Oh, by the way, Brian, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, can I be uh, okay for the audience? Well, I'll, I'll plunge on in, um, in the belief that everything's okay. And uh, I- uh, hey, Everything I'll, is okay, Tom. Uh, everything is okay. Good. If you sit Excellent. back, if you could just sit back a little bit, yeah, yes, that's indeed. great. And uh, your good looks are mesmerizing everyone. So oh, carry okay. on. <laughs> I, I know it's a it's a problem I've always I've been afflicted with. But um, the uh, uh, I uh, uh, was immediately interested in this man because although I'd seen Holocaust survivors at events in Sydney, I'd never got up close to one. I'd never suddenly found myself in a long conversation with a survivor who was vocal. And this man, whose name was Leopold Pfefferberg, a Germanic name for a Polish Jew, <coughs> Paul Deck Pfefferberg, his um, uh, uh, story, uh, his capacity to tell a story was of uh, a great order. And I immediately thought, what is, it, what is it about you? It struck me. What is it about you, man talking to me, a member of the same talking to me? Very funny, very uh, vivid turn of phrase. And my betters, I'm a hillbilly from Australia my betters in Northern Europe had decided again and again and again throughout history that you were a threat to Western civilization. You had to be, your oxygen had to be taken from you. And that was the first time I actually went so far as to ask myself that question. Why does this human standing before me, uh, why has he arrested the hatred of Christendom to the extent that he has to die in the view of uh, a great part of Europe. He had not only in Germany, he has to die for the good of Western civilization. You know, where does Mendelssohn fit into this? Where does, uh, uh, where do all the great Jewish artists uh, and writers fit into this? Where does, Kafka fit into this. And so that was a question that every uh, Gentile who gets close to uh, members of the Jewish community ends up asking themselves, why did someone ever thought you were toxic to Western civilization? And of course they thought his wife was toxic. I went to the, out to the um, repair room and there I met uh, Pfefferberg's wife, uh, Mila, Ludmila, who was the child of uh, Luov uh, Jews, of a, a doctor and a, um, a, 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 a and uh, both her parents' physicians. She was studying in uh, Vienna at the time of the Anschluss, and she then went home to Luov thereafter. But she actually saw Hitler enter Vienna. And uh, she uh, met Paul Deck in the Krakow uh, ghetto after the Lwów ghetto people were rounded up and sent down there. Um, and what was it about her 
22 that made the instruments of the right state determined to extinguish her life when she was just a granny in the repair room of a of a luggage goods store and so um uh they pole deck had a in the back of the store a number of filing cabinets and he put it with and it was from that filing cabinet that i first saw a copy of schindler's list i saw his name on it and i saw her name she was a metal arbiter. She'd been a medical student. Here she was, a metal worker. Uh, and uh, uh, when you see uh, two people you know on a list like that, it, it's a big moment in your life. Uh, these people have been reduced by uh, a state apparatus to the status of untermenschen and Un Unterfrauen. And um, uh, again, uh, what, what was it that made Poldek an Untermensch and what, uh, what was it that made it possible for her to be an Unterfrau? And uh, of course, the sinister thing of defining humans like that is that some of the victims begin through the way they're treated to half think they are Unterfrau and Untermensch. And so these were the questions that I was facing coming from a new world country like Australia, uh, really facing them for the first time, rather late in my life, uh, in my late 40s. Anyhow, I, um, I was fascinated by the Schindler story. In his filing cabinets, he had telegrams from the SS, between Grossrosen, as you know, these work camps often had Hauptlager uh, above them, uh, a high camp, and his was Grossrosen. And he was subject, the movie didn't quite show this, he was subject to inspections all the time from uh, officials from that higher camp. And uh, he had to run a very delicate balance, although he wasn't a man for delicate balances. He operated by instinct, but he had to satisfy Gross Rosen. At the same time, satisfy his own desire for wealth and his desire, and, and to be fair to her, his wife's passionate desire that these people should live and uh, should not be killed in some end of war um, Hecaton, uh, as the uh, before the Russians arrived, and uh, I well, I was fascinated by all this, but I thought you're not Jewish, um, you're of uh, my grandparents were Irish. I have many Australian convicts in my background. I hasten to say it wasn't hard to be a convict in Ireland. I mean, Richard Flanagan, another Australian Booker Prize winner. Uh, a Rhodes Scholar from Tasmania, he, uh, I'm dropping a name there with uh, South African uh, redolence, as you see, Rhodes Scholar. Uh, Flanagan's ancestors stole food from a guarded convoy that was being sent east of the port, port of Dublin to be sent to England. Uh, one of the tragedies of world famines is that and of the Irish famine is that harvests were shipped out to uh, overseas markets at the height of the famine. And Richard Flanagan's ancestors stole some of that food. Um, and uh, uh, I think, I don't think I would have written this book if I hadn't had convict forebears, a political prisoner. Uh, who was on the last convict ship to WA, who got 10 years for sedition. Um, if I hadn't had people like that, who were, uh, had themselves been, to an extent, lesser persons at some time, I don't think I would have habitually 
thought from that area of humanity. And uh, not that I'm saying I'm at all um, a, a noble personage, because um, uh, even in my childhood, uh, Aboriginals were subject to what would be considered now the most heinous conditions of life and the most dreadful standards of, of health um, and education. In any case, uh, I was very interested in this subject. What I think interested me is that I was only one degree of separation from the Nazis. My father, at the end of the Depression, joined the Australian Army, and he was sent overseas to the Middle East. He had all these Irish rebels in his family background, <laughs> but you take a job where you can get it, and uh, he was sent overseas. He's a very colorful uh, character. He had this great capacity of verbal poetry. Uh, and that oral tradition is like the oral tradition of Jewish people uh, within Jewish families, between immigrant parents and, and native children in Australia and in the US. Uh, I love the um, exchanges that Jewish folk uh, within the family because they remind me under another idiom of exchanges that happen in my family. So um, I was raised with a very strong sense of the famine and because of the convicts, I was raised with a very strong sense of how easily easy it was if you were hungry and if you didn't have good land tenure, if you didn't have enough ground to grow potatoes on, how easy it was to oppress people under an imperial system. And I, uh, which in saying that, um, I've been a very lucky fellow with the British and uh, if I might paraphrase a clunky, paraphrase a clunky uh, aphorism that was uh, mocked in the 1970s here, a uh, politician said as if he deserved a medal, some of my best friends are Jewish. And so some of my best friends are, uh, are English and we're all members of the same species. And the English didn't give their own ordinary people an easy time of it either in the old days. And so um, uh, I think all that contributed to the sense that what a tragedy it was that these people were extracted from their normal life and put in a zone where they were considered expendable, that what you did to them didn't have to be explained. And that's what happens with the great racial tragedies of our time and of all time, that you put people in a zone where they're being so verbally condemned, they're now condemned by the state. Doesn't particularly, you know, don't worry about them. They're very difficult people. Oh God, we had to, we had to kill a few of them for their own good because they're so stupid, etc. They're also too bright as well as being dark. You know, all those contradictions of racial hysteria have always fascinated me. Now, my father, to get back to him, he um, was in the Middle East for three years, and he would send back to me every month or so uh, Nazi memorabilia from places like Alam Halfa, Alamein, Benghazi. I have still in my tie drawer uh, a, a Mauser uh, pistol holster from El Alamein. And so I was only one degree of separation, living in Homebush, New South Wales, by the railway line, I was one degree of separation from the Third Reich. And I don't think, uh, I, I think therefore, inevitably, through a sort of paternal duty and interest, I was interested in the Reich and interested in the Jews. Now, as I said, we were devout Catholics being um, 
being Irish. I'd, I'd like you to uh, think a bit kindly of the Irish. They're sometimes a hard race to accept, but you have to remember that the education of an, an Irish Catholic under penal law in Ireland only abolished in the 19th century and taking some decades to get rid of uh, to educate a, um, a, a, a Catholic child by anyone other than a Protestant uh, was a crime, was one of the penal crimes. We were not allowed schooling. Uh, we were not allowed to attend a university uh, to practice the law or to become an officer in the British Army. And these were, um, therefore, we were unrepresented, we were uneducated. But when education came, as with the, as with the, the, the Jewish community, we, we embraced it and, and we became people of the book. And if you lived in Ireland, you'd see that they're people with great verbal felicity. And now they've got one of the best education systems in Europe. And the young Irish immigrants who come here are all IT people and financial people. In my day, they would have been like, well, like my grandfather, a wagon driver from County Cork. And, um, but a man who yearned for poetry, who wrote poetry, and yearn for poetry. So there is a certain similarity uh, there. And uh, as often happens when you don't educate a people, you can then make jokes about them. Hence that good old chestnut of the Irish joke, which I don't mind, you know. Uh, in, in America, they're Polish jokes. The Poles get it in the neck in America. And in, in, uh, in Canada, they're Newfoundlander jokes. <laughs> in any case, um, we, our passion for education in my mother's generation was such that it, it was to escape being the butt jokes. If you became an educated person, we're very much Australian, but we're very conscious of our ancestry. And to escape the shame of our ancestry, the shame imposed from above, what do you do? You show your, you can be as clever as any other Gentile. <laughs> yeah. My mother, this was a mission she had. And I know, having seen Jewish grannies and Jewish mothers on the stage and read about them in books like the great books of Saul Bellow, for example, and the great books of Mordecai Richler, the, uh, from uh, St. Urbain Street in, in Quebec. Uh, I know that you know <laughs> what I'm talking about. And so uh, I felt uh, attracted to this. Now, one of the great attractions of it uh, is that it was during the Ukrainian famine that a bureaucrat, a Soviet bureaucrat, was making a um, a report to the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and he said that tragically, uh, by then, more than a million people had died. And it is said to be Stalin who then said, no, no, not tragically. Uh, one person's death is a tragedy. A million people's death is a statistic. Now, the problem with a million people's death, and this was pointed out in a great book by um, an Israeli uh, anthropologist, scholar, etc., cetera, uh, Harari, uh, called Sapiens. He says that the reason we have a clan group of about 150, why we have a company in the army of 150, why the company in the army is the same size as a Roman century was in the Roman army. Why is that so? Because 150 people is about the limit of 
the number of people we can know intimately. We can know their twitches, we can know their nickname, we can know what they did when they were kids, we can know whether they were happy at school or not, they can, we can know what their romantic history is. And um, uh, there's always a tension in human beings between that tribe whom we know intimately, and therefore they're all safe people. They're probably not going to ever do us any harm. Or if they do, we're going to forgive it more easily. And then the fact that, that we're all children of the one African mother, mitochondria leave, whose mitochondria is said to be in, in every man and woman. Every woman who gives birth has the same mitochondria. And so whenever we meet other humans, we're, we're torn between seeing them as fellow uh, members of the species and children of the same mother, and a deluvian mother, of course. But we, although I have thought of writing a book called um, The Love Life of Mitochondrial Eve. However, that another time. Um, and that tension makes, tri you know, between tribalism and our solidarity with each other has always fascinated me. And of course, the thing about Schindler was that he transcended that tension. Uh, he was able to, and he was a German barbarian. He was the, from the Sudetenland, which meant that he um, came from the uh, German equivalent of Queensland. And therefore, he, he was uh, not a big metropolitan. You know, he, he hadn't been to music school in, in, um, in Württemberg, or he hadn't been to a great German university. Uh, and um, the, uh, uh, he, he did have one advantage for me, he was a Catholic. But anyhow, as you know, ultimately under the pressure from Holde, who was determined I was going to write it, and I said I'm not even a metropolitan Europe, European, I'm from Australia, it's after us, you get the apre nu la penguin of uh, of Antarctica, uh, he said that that's good. You don't have an axe to grind, etc. I quickly discovered that he had total access to the, uh, the the Schindler community throughout the world, and having him travel with me when I interviewed them was essential because he could vouch for me. At that stage, the survivors were successful people in the various communities, and they had managed to live with what had happened to them. But they, were, they weren't old, and they felt no necessity to go back to the time when they were, by decree, subhuman. And so uh, he uh, sometimes, pretty ruthlessly, argued them into giving me interviews and uh, that made the book possible and the effect of meeting him in Beverly Hills was multiplied again and again and again by meeting them and it became obvious that I would have to write this factually because it would have to be a documentary narrative because everyone a lot of the people whom I uh, interviewed wanted to see um, what I wrote about them. Uh, some people, uh, Moshe Basky was a great figure involved in Oscar's um, Black Marketeering, which isn't told about in the, as much in the, in the movie. And uh, Moshe Basky became a very progressive Israeli Supreme Court judge, but he was Oscar's forger. So during the time of that second factory in Moravia, up near the um, near the Polish border, uh, he could uh, Schindler would bring him uh, German export documents, and Schindler would say to him, to his prisoner, "Listen, I, I want to plunder this tobacco factory in Brno, and uh, could you produce this sort of 
passport document, which will enable me to plunder it and take all the cigarettes into Poland and sell them. Uh, and uh, that's the sort of thing Basky did. He was a very good forger, apparently. He could make German stamps out of wood. And uh, Oscar was running a black market operation to an extraordinary extent, which the film, again, film is very restrictive in what it can tell you. And the last couple of weeks, I've, I've said, uh, I actually made contact with the great man, Spielberg, and I said, um, I wrote a 10-page document covering all the stuff that we could make a mini-series out of, a la Netflix. Just imagine that, you know. And, and Spielberg has made some mini-series, such as, um, uh, you know, Band of Brothers and so on, very good mini-series. I said, we can tell all these stories about Oscar as well. As well as that, we can go into his marriage, we can go into pre and post-war, uh, we could go into his uh, relationships with people, uh, you know, uh, in, let me give you an example, and I will close with this because it's time you had questions. But in the terrible winter of 1944, a group of trucks, cattle trucks, turned up in the local railway yard. Seems that Oscar was, um, told about it by his brother-in-law, who was a railway man. They heard human scratchings and cries from inside these cars. These pleadings were uttered in many tongues, for the trapped men were, according to the manifest that the railway people had, Slovenes, Poles, Czechs, Germans, Frenchmen, Hungarians, Netherlanders, and Serbians. And they were inside these carriages that had somehow come from Auschwitz and ended up in the uh, railway yards at Spitavi, which was a morning of gruesome cold, minus 30 degrees Celsius, says Stern. Even the exact Biberstein says it was at least 20 degrees. Poldek Pfefferberg <coughs> was summoned uh, minus 20 degrees. <coughs> Poldek Pfefferberg, my old friend, was summoned from his bunk left his welding gear and went out to the snowy siding to cut open the doors, iced hard as iron. He too heard the unearthly complaints from within. It is hard to describe what they saw when the doors were at last opened. In each car, in each car, a pyramid of frozen corpses. Their limbs, madly contorted, occupied the center. The hundred or more still living stank awesomely, were seared black by frostbite, were skeletal. Not one of them would be found to weigh more than 75 pounds. This is a very dramatic. Now, Oscar's not supposed, Oscar's supposed to tell Gross Rosen, Oscar's supposed to tell his SS garrison, and they're supposed to be killed. Oscar took them in. It's extraordinary how many uh, Oscar. Uh, took in illicitly to his last factory. And of course, Spielberg had to find a quick way of saying that and find his way through. So I've recommended we make a mini series. He said, no, he's got, he's got the image of Oscar where he wants it. And it is the basis for his Shoah Foundation, which is an extraordinary uh, cyber base for a, the research of an international catastrophe. And he doesn't want to mess with Oscar's image. However, I will keep on pleading occasionally, Dudley, because he is a, a very genial man, but he, he, he doesn't like obsessed people other than himself. And so, uh, there may one day be a series in which that story is told. I think I can leave the rest of what I have to say for your questions. And, uh, but I do hope that answers some mysteries about where this book came from, why it was written by an Australian, why it was written by a former seminarian, uh, but who quickly learned 
Okay, the priesthood is a rotten way to meet women, I can tell you. And um, yeah. who, who left before ordination. But uh, I, I don't think all I was taught in there was absolute rubbish, particularly my scriptural studies which again gave me a sense of the Essenes, the Zealots, the people who died at Masada. And I've always been uh, interested in, in how anti-Semitism grew out of early Christianity, because I'm aware, last of all, when traveling in China, whatever problems the Chinese have, they aren't blighted with anti-Semitism. And they're very proud of the way Jewish communities operated in Shanghai and other international enclaves, even up in Harbin in Manchuria. That being said, thank you for listening and uh, not shouting me down. And uh, we can have questions under the direction of our handsome chairman, Brian Fine. Tom, uh, <laughs> I think the, I, I do have a question here. Is there something in your life that made you particularly interested in racial and religious um, areas? Yes, I tell you what, it, it, it's definitely the Aboriginals. Uh, I started my conscious life in the family hometown to which my Irish grandparents went. Uh, one grandfather was uh, uh, an Irish engine driver, but a very well-read man and a strong unionist. The other was uh, also a very well-read uh, man uh, and poetic and my how many families are like that my granny was a hard-headed peasant and not up to nonsense she was only five foot tall but pe people were scared of her in a way they weren't of my uh, grandfather and so they paid up their grocery bills to them uh, in fairly good time because they're scared of her calling round and asking why. In, in any case, um, uh, in this township, there was a great tribe called the Thangali. If any of you are interested in, in rugby league, Greg Inglis of South Sydney was a Thangali. So you can see they're noble people in themselves. And uh, seeing the Aboriginals drift by my gate to go to Friday afternoon shopping, and seeing that, as my mother told me, and my mother was very pro-Aboriginal for a country girl, uh, that they had uh, in fear, you know, terrible ear infections, terrible skin infections, was all true. You could, in those days, you could see it. So I thought, now why, why are they like that, me like me? I, I thought in a primitive way. Then I go to the movies, and this will be familiar to you from your own experience. The Aboriginals had to sit in the front of the cinema. So we had our apartheid too. It was less formal than South African apartheid, but it was moved by the same, uh, by the same instincts. And, and the same Hitlerian belief that um, indeed, uh, uh, what, I'm sorry, I've lost the picture, but that doesn't matter. I'll get it back here. Yeah. Um, so my first experience of racial hysteria were the Aboriginals. They were both dumb, according to the formulae of racism, they are both fatally dumb and fatally bright and cunning. They are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They're in their case, we're falling back in our prejudices on the idea that uh, the nomad is inevitably inferior. Otherwise, he would have settled down and become a farmer like us, or a servant of farmers, as people in country towns are. And um, the old antipathy, the oldest, that between settled humans and nomadic humans, came out in our prejudice against these people. And uh, that was the, uh, the other conundrum was, my uncle drove the Kempsey wagon, the honey wagon, as they call it in America, the uh, wagon 
where people's waste was collected. There was no sewage in the country in those days. So in the late 30s, early 40s, uh, I would go with him uh, out to the Aboriginal camp and he would collect the cans of waste from the Aboriginal camp and put them in his honey wagon and drive it away. My father used to make great jokes with my mother uh, at my mother's expense about the fact that her brother-in-law was a, a, a dunny cart dri driver, as we called it. In any case, um, uh, I, it, I asked myself, not in a moral sense, but just puzzled about the age of six, I said, why do we, can't we sit with them in the cinema when a white man collects their human waste? And that was the, the beginning of my puzzling <laughs> about race. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's always the, a human who will say, when you told, don't mix, when you told, don't mix with those guys, they kill Christ. Some people say, oh, I don't want to mix with them. No, no, they, there are others who say, how oh, interesting. Yeah, they'd be interesting to get to know. <laughs> and I think I had a bit of the latter in me because I have so many Aboriginal friends and I have so many Jewish friends. And so that was my experience. I think that, that answers the question. There was an interesting question. Now, I know that um, we are pushing time, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to continue. Um, I hope it's okay with anyone else, but um, there was a question, and I guess I'd rephrase it. If you were making the movie, would you tell the same story as we saw depicted on the screen, uh, especially in, as you see, uh, Schindler himself as an opportunist. Well, I'd be lucky to tell it as well as Spielberg did because he managed to get it into three and a quarter hours. Oscar's history is so complex. There are so many subplots that he had to take shortcuts even so, such as say on the screen, Oscar's factory didn't produce a single shell. That is the case, but it's a bigger story. It's a more complex story than that. I, I, Not I, only did it produce a, a single shell, but he was making a fortune on the black market to the extent that a lot of Jewish prisoners, frankly, told me they, they wished he did make shells because he had inspectors coming through all the time and he had to... Um, try to persuade them. He was having development problems. He's on the break, on the edge of, of being a full-scale manufacturer of a range of uh, millimetric uh, ballistics. Uh, but all his efforts went into uh, the black market and uh, enterprises like saving the men who were alive that he found in those carriages. And so, um, uh, I would try to tell, if I could, a bit about the black market, because it shows up even more uh, what he was, um, uh, what a complex character he was, uh, what a contradictory saviour. And I know Spielberg took a, a lot of effort to tell that story for the simple reason that I was in Poland the day he shot a scene that didn't uh, shed um, great sympath light, sympathetic light on Schindler, but it ended up being a, screen, uh, a, a, a scene for which there wasn't room in the final cut, narratively. It was a, it was a, a, a little diversion, and um, I can see that. So even Spielberg, when he was making his movie, I mean, what I'd love to happen is that he produces a six hour director's cut, which shows a lot of the scenes uh, which were, were, were cut out. Um, and uh, he, he told me, I was teaching at University of California then, and he told me he meant to um, 
film it in black and white, which everyone he mentioned it to thought was a crazy idea. We can't think of it any other way now, this narrative. And um, he told me he was going to take a very handsome Anglo-Irish boy, Rafe Fiennes, and turn him into a monster. And Rafe Fiennes was the most gentle character that you could possibly meet. After, after filming, he would not dare to come and have a drink with the rest of us who'd be at the table. I used to have to go and invite him to join us. He'd be sitting up at the bar reading the, uh, this mixture between a dyslexic English boy and the monster he was playing. So Spielberg did a great job. But there are, I, there's even more complication for Oscar. And part of it was because he was an agent of uh, German military intelligence. Well, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Absolutely. I think that answers the question because the questions were coming through as to uh, the fact that he was painted as a saint uh, at times, and yet there were other people that saw different sides to him and how complex it was. Well, Tom, I, I was fascinated by the story as I was fascinated by um, the book. Uh, and I'd like to say a big thank you. I see there are some questions still coming through, um, but we're now uh, nearly going on to one o'clock and I think our time is gonna run out with the Nira. So on behalf of us all, um, and um, I, I'd just like to say thank you for coming. We had a great crowd, we had a great meeting, and we look forward to many more of your stories. And um, what, more, what more can I say? To everybody who came, I'd just like to say thank you for coming. The sign up here on my right hand side says uh, Shana Tova. We wish you the best over this. Um, um, uh, the holy period that's coming up and uh, for you and your families, the Alta Zachen are there for you. So thank you for coming and that we conclude our meeting. Thank you again, Tom. Thank you.